Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland Public Television with host Bethany Wesley. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello. Welcome back to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. For tonight's show, we turn our attention to a popular destination in downtown Bemidji. The Headwater Science Center first opened in the summer of 1993, initially boasting a selection of handmade exhibits and a science-centered gift shop. The center continued to grow over the last 24 years, and its offerings now feature live animals, many more exhibits, and increased opportunities for hands-on science exploration. Today, the Science Center continues its mission by offering science and technology-focused exhibits and programming to the greater Bemidji region. Tonight, I welcome to the program Annie Butler-Ricks, the Executive Director of the Headwater Science Center, and Mindy Clark, a Science Center board member who also co-chairs its marketing committee. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. As we get started, first let's talk about the basics of the Science Center itself in terms of the size, how many exhibits, how do you kind of introduce the Science Center to people? Yeah, so we have a 7,500 square foot exhibit floor, which sounds really big, and it is. <laughs> um, we have over 40 um, interactive exhibits, and then we have a lot of live animals. And I think that's a really big draw that children love and adults love coming and um, holding our animals. And we have um, a lot of reptiles, a lot of snakes. Um, we have a hedgehog, and I really happen to like him. <laughs> He's my favorite, but um, we have birds. We have three live raptors also. That is a great addition. You know, those are permitted. We have a raptors program. We provide a lot of education with them. Um, so how many annual visitors come in an average year? We'll get to why this was a little unique soon enough, but mm -hmm. in an average year, how many visitors do you typically host a year? Mm -hmm. Around 25 to 27,000. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And where do they come from? Obviously, you're in Bemidji, so you serve mm -hmm. Bemidji, but from how wide the region do your visitors typically come? So we don't track them okay. exactly, but um, what we do know is that most of our members are from um, the Bemidji area and then Minnesota, okay. um, but we do have people who get memberships to our museum from all over the country. Oh, wow. And so, and in the summer, the majority of our um, visitors to the museum are people from out of town. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Who are visiting. Mm -hmm. So do you have an ideal guest? Like, is there an ideal age? Is it young kids, older kids, tweens, teens, adults? I think right now a lot of the exhibits are geared towards kids and maybe the three to 10 year old range. But that is something that we have been working on changing and we're getting some, we've actually gotten some new exhibits recently mm -hmm. oh. that appeal more towards um, older, kids to the teenagers mm -hmm. to adults and we're seeing more of that we're seeing more of Bemidji State students coming in um, to uh, experiment with some of the exhibits to see the animals so we have um, the last director uh, got some math puzzles games and I have seen adults sit at those <laughs> And there's a bunch of different little ones, and they sit at those for an hour sometimes and can't figure it out, and they love it because of the challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so something really. that's just, oh, I can do this really quickly. It's, oh, I got this. And then on the same hand, I've seen a seven-year-old solve those same problems. <laughs> so I think that's just the perfect example of how it works for everyone. Well, some ages. of our exhibits are just fun. We have little kids that love the bubble wall and then we have adults who've never played with such a thing and are fascinated mm -hmm. by it and are trying to figure out, can I make one of these at home? <laughs> we, and the uh, teenagers especially love the reptiles. So I'll see, I'll pop in on a Tuesday afternoon and I'll see a pretty substantial group of our Bemidji High School kids holding the reptiles and checking out the birds, sitting in front of the fish tank. Oh, fun. As we move forward to talk some about the specifics of the center, I want to get to know you guys just a little bit for mm -hmm. myself and also for our viewers. Mm -hmm. So, Mindy, how long have you been a board member? I have been a board member about two years. And what led you to initially get involved with the Science Center? I actually hadn't even heard of the Science Center until a friend of mine invited me to the annual gala called E-Cubed. Um, she said, it's food and alcohol and music. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And while we were there, I should have known something was up her sleeve. She said, I think you should become a board member. <laughs> and I agreed, and here I am. Okay. <laughs> Enjoyable. Obviously, you've stuck with it. Mm -hmm. I have stuck with it. It's a fun group of people, and we get to work with science, and we get to work with kids who are pretty excited about the whole thing. Oh, cool. And Annie, you're still relatively new to the director position. So when did you first take over the position? Um, Mid-May Mid of this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you first came, it was a pretty exciting time at the Science Center, correct? You were undergoing a campaign to raise funds. Yes. What we were had, those funds for? We had just finished the Dino Run, which Annie and her husband had actually helped co-chair the year before with the Dino Run to replace the carpeting. Um, the carpet in the center was about... 30 years old. <laughs> it was time. <laughs> it was past time. <laughs> and you actually were successful. You brought in the money. We were successful. We brought in the money. Um, we raised quite a bit with the Dino Run and then through various generous corporations throughout Bemidji, we were able to raise the funds and get the carpet installed. When was the carpet installed? Oh, she knows that better than um, I do. <laughs> yeah, so I started mid-May and mm -hmm. that is our really busy field trip season. And okay. so that goes until about the beginning of June and then just um, maybe mid-June, as soon as you know, we sort of were able to wrap things up with field trip season, we started on the carpet. Okay. And then something else happened. So what, your fall has been interesting. What happened after, after that? Yeah, so um, <laughs> the, the carpeting project took a little bit longer than we anticipated. Um, and we finished in August with our um, remodeling and it was it was looking great it was uh, you know a busy hectic summer for everyone but it it was looking great and then um, about two to three weeks after our carpeting was done being installed um, one of my staff members came in um, on a Saturday morning we were really lucky in that he had an outreach he was supposed to be going to so he came in early to mm -hmm. find himself in a couple inches of water splashing around um, we later learned that a um, Pipe, a piece of tubing, so a smaller pipe than you know a pipe inside your walls, but okay. a piece of tubing going to um, a fish tank had burst and was running. We don't know for how long. Most long likely, <laughs> most likely all night. <laughs> and I know at first, right? Didn't you try to see if you could kind of clean it up and save parts, if not the majority of inside, and you found it just wasn't going to be possible. Yes, I got the phone call to go to the science center with a wet vac. And I was expecting not that. <laughs> and I arrived to find that there was, I want to say, three to five standing inches of water throughout the majority of the floor. Okay. Um, and Annie had already called Service Master, and they were on their way. Mm -hmm. um, community volunteers show, showed up. Our Headwaters volunteers showed up. Our entire staff was there. It was... It was quite the disaster. <laughs> it was. A friend showed up to pick up my kids who were splashing through the water, you know, trying to help. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a big effort that day to try to get us so we could open Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we did. We opened on Sunday, had a big day, lots of visitors, and then we learned the next Monday that things just weren't drying out how they should be. Mm -hmm. And so unlike when the carpet went in the very first time, you kind of kept, it, they kept the Science Center open and portions, right? You were kind of doing mm -hmm. the carpet in portions. Mm -hmm. This time you found out that just wasn't going to be possible. Right. No. How long did you end up being closed for? Seven weeks. Okay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about where your funding comes from. So 65% of our funding comes from daily admission mm -hmm. and annual memberships to the museum. Mm -hmm. So, which is huge. If you look at most museums, it's not even close to that. It might be more in the 10 to 20%. Okay. So, when our funding is coming from that, being closed for seven weeks is, is really difficult. It is. The other 35%, 30%, I'm not the math whiz. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm on the marketing committee and not the finance committee. Um, the, the other percentage is raised throughout the community with um, individual donors, corporate donors, not just throughout the community, but really throughout the region. Mm -hmm. okay. Legislative the legislative um, grants that we yes. get, a few okay. things like that. Mm -hmm. How did you feel supported by the community while you were closed? Like, were people upset that you were closed or were the community just trying to help you out? Or what was kind of the response from your clientele? People were very, very supportive. Um, the hardest part were the kids that were crying outside the Science Center <laughs> um, on a fairly regular basis when pa their parents didn't know we were closed. And yes. I would try to go out and greet them individually. and. 
even let them come take oh. a peek and <laughs> see that and tell them we reopened. But um, you know, we had businesses, uh, business owners stopping in to see what they could do to help. Mm -hmm. We had people calling, offering whatever we needed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I've responded to all of the Facebook messages and text or texts that I got those first couple days from the community just saying, mm -hmm. what can we do? Mm -hmm. And we posted on Facebook. Originally, we didn't realize it was quite as large as it had ended up being. And um, a radio station picked up a Facebook post mm -hmm. and asked people to show up with wet vax and help, and people came. So it was, it was by that point in time, Service Master were, was there, and we were all breathing a sigh of relief. But people came. It was very nice to see. I'm assuming that they were also there for you when you did reopen your doors. Yes. Yes. And so mm -hmm. things are back. If you're back in operation, things are going swimmingly, hopefully. Yes. yes. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about some, we've talked a little bit in the intro in terms of the exhibits have expanded, you have animals, mm -hmm. but there also seems to have been an increased emphasis on programming, like not just the hands-on opportunities, but educational opportunities at the Science Center. Mm -hmm. Mindy, has that been a deliberate choice? Absolutely. We think that to create value to the community as a whole, that it's really our responsibility to help raise up the next set of children into science-minded adults. If we can get them fascinated right now and get them started in the learning process, things outside what their teachers are normally able to teach them in school due to curriculum and timing requirements, get them excited about something and interested in science so that they be can become the next doctor, the next engineer, really inspire them to do more than sometimes what I feel like they necessarily think they can do from small town Minnesota. Get them to think bigger. Yes, think bigger. And so these are different opportunities, because I know you host field trips in different mm -hmm. groups mm -hmm. and things, but this isn't, these programming opportunities are unique, correct? Tell me a little bit about them. What, what types of programming options are there? Yeah, so some of our sort of more traditional programming is after school science clubs during the school year. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a science club for kids in about uh, grades age, uh, excuse me, grades three to five. And they do just a variety of things from, um, they learned about ecosystems this last week, um, to going outside and exploring fall leaves and looking mm -hmm. at color and talking about that. So that's sort of our traditional one. We have a younger, um, a program called Pint Size Science for the younger kids. And that's really just to um, help the kids and the parents understand that exploring the world around you is science. Mm -hmm. And that that is such an important learning opportunity. And so showing not only kids, but their parents, what you can do to help encourage your kids' creativity in the sort of STEM field, science, techni um, technology, engineering, and math. And I know you touched on this a little bit, but do you mm -hmm. feel that your role in education in terms of science is unique in a smaller town versus like a larger metropolitan area? Is there a service here that's unique in that way in terms of the way that children are given opportunities to learn about science? I feel like definitely yes. I come from a larger metropolitan area where it's, it's pretty standard course for children to be exposed to more simply because of the bigger town, the more opportunities, more museums. For a lot of children in our region, the Headwater Science Museum is really the only thing that they have that exposes them to thinking about caring about animals is related to science. Going and learning on a Saturday science activity about aviation and airflow and wind dynamics, that's science. It's it broadens their horizon and allows them to think about different things that they wouldn't necessarily be exposed to living in a smaller town. They're really lucky to be exposed to agriculture here in a way that big city kids aren't, and they have a great understanding of that. We want to broaden their horizons and show them a little more. I know that not only do people come to you, but you go out to them. So tell me about your outreach. How does that work, and in what situations have you done that? Yes, so we do quite a bit of outreach. Um, as you probably know, the transportation expenses are a really big cost of field trips. And so for many schools, especially those in small, more rural areas than Bemidji, that is just too large of a cost for them to come to us. And so in those cases, you know, or really whenever anyone asks us, we will pack up our Science Center van mm -hmm. and we will head and to a school, to a community center, to a library, um, 
to, we've done all sorts of different events, um, outdoor events, indoor events, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we'll really do all sorts of things. We'll set up a um, portable planetarium and do some star shows. Um, we've uh, traveled as far north as um, Lake of the Woods School, really up right at the border, spent the whole day with the entire Lake of the Woods School. And what a great opportunity that is for the kids mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. to spend some time, five of my staff went up, and to really spend time mm -hmm doing science almost all day. I just mm -hmm. think that's such a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we're willing to travel. I mean, we'll go out for birthday parties. We'll do, <laughs> we'll, we'll do anything. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how you keep the Science Center offerings fresh. How often are you adding new exhibits? How far down the low road do you look in mm -hmm. terms of developing new offerings? Yeah, well, that's something I'm thinking about mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. Even when I'm doing the more mundane um, tasks that I do as the executive director, I'm always thinking, what can we be doing in 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. 2020? Um, so there have been lots of studies that talk about rotating exhibits, that it's important to have some key exhibits, but then to have some that rotate. Um, mm -hmm. So we're gonna be trying to do that a little bit more. Um, we have two new exhibits in the Science Center right now with um, three more coming in the next month or two. So I'm really trying to get some fresh things in there. I do like it when people say, oh, I came here when I was in third grade and it hasn't changed at all, but really part of me wants them to say, Oh, and I love the new exhibits at the end of that. <laughs> like, I just need a little bit more. So I am always thinking about how can we change programming? How can we reach more people? How can we reach um, not just the normal, typical visitor to the Science Center, but how can we reach those kids whose families can't afford um, a daily admission or an annual pass to the museum? So we have a few initiatives we're working on. We are recently um, a member of Museums for All, which is a nationwide initiative that um, allows um, visitors with um, an EBT card, electronic benefits transfer card, to come to the museum for $3 a person. So we're really trying to, I'm always thinking about things like that, uh, brainstorming with my staff, with my board, mm -hmm. how can we keep growing and reach more people? Mm -hmm. You had just said a few minutes ago about rotating exhibits and keeping mm -hmm. them fresh. Are there systems in place that allow you to rotate or how does that work? Who do you rotate with? Yeah, so we are um, sort of, I guess, lucky that we have a basement and we have a lot of exhibits that some people have given us. So Science Museum of Minnesota um, will give us exhibits um, sometimes. Um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has given us exhibits. That's one of our new ones that's coming actually. Um, but I have, uh, my former, the former executive director had worked really hard on um, making relationships with small children's museums in the area because there aren't really any other small science museums in the area. We're the only science museum between Winnipeg and the Twin Cities. Oh. So there's not anyone at sort of the science museum level that we can trade exhibits with, but we do um, share exhibits with the Duluth Children's Museum, which is a great museum that um, you can go to if you have an annual membership at our <laughs> museum. Um, and so we're really working on, I'm working on continuing to cultivate those relationships to get new exhibits in. Is that one of the strengths that comes from partnerships then, as you develop relationships and partnerships is the way that you guys can grow off each other? Definitely. Yes. And we've had some past exhibits that have been donated by um, corporations within the community. Paul Bunyan Telecommunications um, provided one with, for us. Uh, Sanford Health provided one mm -hmm. for us. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, tell us about uh, the community in terms, we talked about how they supported you through your, the disaster with the, the flooded floor mm -hmm. and everything. Talk to us a little bit about the community as a whole. Do you feel like the community has always been behind the Science Center and is always hoping that it helps to grow? And I think this is an interesting point of conversation for both Annie and I being newer to the Bemidji area. I didn't hear about the Science Center. I don't have little children. I have older children um, for a while while living here. And then when I talked to people, very few people knew very much about it. So while I feel about, while I feel like the people who know about the Science Center support it, I feel like there's a huge segment of the population who's missing us entirely. Is that one of the keys then in the outreach is as you go out, you hope that not only are they learning from your on-site visits, but that perhaps if they're ever in town, they would support you they back. They would support yes. us, yes. And have you seen that happen? Um, yes, I think we see people from, you know, who come from further away to come visit us, from Park Rapids, mm -hmm. um, okay. 
from Grand Rapids, they'll come and visit us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, you know, I think a lot of people do see the Science Museum as a place to take their kids in that three to nine year old range. Mm -hmm. And really, we wanna be the place that people are coming to for anything science related in Bemidji. That mm -hmm. coming to Saturday science events, coming to our programming that is geared towards older kids and adults, that we're sort of the first place that people look for that. Mm -hmm. How has your attendance been in recent years? Have you been increasing? Has it been pretty stable? Has it kind of been up and down? Like, how has it been? Do you, I mean, I'm assuming it's, it's track. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking about the, the graph well, okay. in my mind right now <laughs> of how it'll look after this year. <laughs> it has definitely um, increased yes. over the years. Um, you know, we're very seasonal, so our summers are our very busy months, including mm -hmm. field trips. But each year we're increasing, and we used to say, um, even though I've only been there since May, you know, I've heard my staff say this, that on a warm summer day um, in Bemidji, you know, oh, numbers will be low at the museum. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to want to be in the lake. Not this summer. Mm -mm. I mean, we, it would be gorgeous 80 degrees outside and sunny, and we would be packed. And I think it's things like that that mm -hmm. just show we're continuing to grow in popularity. Mm -hmm. As you look at planning additions and expansions in the future, how much of your own personal interest and your own background kind of drives that? Because I know that you came to the Science Center from a previous position at Bemidji State, correct? Yes. So does that impact anyways when you look forward in terms of what you're interested in personally? Definitely. <laughs> so um, I'm a chemist. Okay. So this is um, a little bit of a change for me <laughs> to being an executive director. Um, and I'm a renewable energy chemist. So I studied electron transfer without relates to solar cells. And so one of our brand new exhibits happens to be a solar exhibit. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think it's really important that we have some renewable energy concepts, whether it's solar, wind, you know, geothermal, any of those. Mm -hmm. But um, I was able to make some connections with our real and Bemidji State to um, have that solar exhibit happen. So that's definitely where I'm thinking, but I'm also thinking about just generally how can we expand to reach areas we're not reaching. So mm -hmm. we don't really have a lot of necessarily chemistry exhibits. That's something I'm thinking about, but I'm also thinking about other areas of science. Okay. What was it about this position that interests you then, if it was a little unique from what you had mm -hmm. been doing previously? Yeah, so I'd been at Bemidji State before. I'd been working with students. I'd been teaching. Um, and, you know, it sounds really cliche, but I was ready for something new and a little bit different. And um, this is definitely it. I miss <laughs> chemistry, but every day changes. I don't do the same thing, you know, minute to minute. And that can be a challenge, but it can also just be a wonderful thing. I want to talk about some of the people that help make this happen because while you're certainly the spokesperson in the mm -hmm. face for the Science Center, there's a lot of individuals who help. How big is your staff? Um, we have currently five full-time and five part-time staff. Mm -hmm. okay. And then consistent volunteers. I know that you also have volunteers on hand. Yes, we do. Um, we have anywhere from volunteers that come in almost on a daily basis or at least Monday through Friday mm -hmm. um, to volunteers that come in weekly you know monthly our volunteers are amazing and I don't think I can name them because I'm gonna forget mm -hmm. someone very very crucial and important mm -hmm. but you know dedicated volunteers are really what help run the HSC mm -hmm. there are um, people that built some of the original exhibits who still mm -hmm. stop in to check and see how oh. we're doing and mm -hmm. just check on things <laughs> Do the volunteers usually come to you with some kind of interest or you find a way or to fit them into something that you need or how does that work? Yeah, so we have a volunteer coordinator who um, has um, sort of an application form, but that also helps her figure out sort of what the volunteers' interests are and we go from there. So there are some volunteers that just really want to work with kids and they're great at helping with some of our science clubs. Um, and then we have other volunteers who you know, would prefer to help us dust and clean, and we are more than thankful for that type of volunteering <laughs> also. <laughs> oh, I bet. So here you are on TV. Is there anything that you need or anything that you would ask from the community that would help you guys in this current time? I think the one thing Mindy sort of mentioned is, you know, we definitely want um, people to know that we're here. And even though we've been here, you know, since... Um, the early 1990s mm -hmm. that um, we are a very still small nonprofit at least budget wise mm -hmm. and we would like people to come see the changes we've made see where the direction the Science Center is going and come support us Mindy is working on our um, gala the e-cubed mm -hmm. event yes. um, oh, in February okay. so if you want to help Saturday February 24th will be our annual I think our eighth annual 
seventh or eighth? Seventh. Um, <laughs> we should know that. <laughs> I should know this. <laughs> our annual gala, um, where it's really a time to thank our sponsors and donors. Um, tickets are available for purchase by the public, and our donors and sponsors are able to come and enjoy a mu uh, an evening of good food and music and um, just being in the center at night a little dressed up. A silent auction is always fun, and um, this year we're going to do a big 50-50 raffle, which we're hoping will invite more people to donate a little more money to us. And this is an adult this event, I should yes. specify. An adult right. event, yes. yes. <laughs> and it gives them a chance to see the Science Center in a different different light, a different way. Yes, mm -hmm. we're a great party place. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, but, well, listen, I want to thank you guys for coming on the show tonight and for talking to us about the Science Center and everything that has happened this year and mm -hmm. looking forward to what's coming up. So I thank you. And thank you. I thank, thank you guys you. for tuning in tonight, and I hope you join me next time. Thanks.